Well, hey there, Todd. Good morning. God, you just know, you know that I'm waiting for it and I love it. I also have been watching your videos lately. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, you're sorry. <laughs> Why are you posting them I'm if you're sorry. sorry? But I saw an amazing video of you it's belting in a, was that a ship? Like it's like a, a no. low ceilinged room. Oh, that one. Oh, I sang Dion Ferris. I know what you're doing in the attic. No, that was the attic of one of my jobs. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, at Hawk? Yeah. Oh, at Hawk? So, Did someone, Goldie someone know you were doing yeah, that? I don't know. But literally someone in the comments was like, are you in a bomb shelter? <laughs> I was like, I convinced that you were like the brig of the cruise ship. And I was like, oh man, no. he found himself a little room. It was a very low ceiling. It is but, a very low ceiling. But honestly, ceiling. anybody wants to go see it. He's a fantastic singer at Todd Adamson oh, official. You should go check it out. And you've been doing the rehearsals for the Oxygen Buffer Dancing with the Stars and for the local chapter in Charleston. And I get to come see you. I know. Oh my God. Okay. This is the biggest news is that yes. Todd and I get to be in the same place. <laughs> In what's how many, I guess we're at three weeks now, which scares the crap out of me, but no, I'm so excited. Todd's going to come out and be a part of dancing. Well, because, of, because of the wonderful podcast we did with Crystal Garrett and we talked about asthma camp that sort of led to the American Lung Association, which we're already affiliated with and lurking with, with dancing with the stars. It sort of all kind of came to a, it was a perfect full circle moment. Yeah. yeah. And I'm so excited that, that they shared the podcast, yes. the American Lung Association. Shout out to you guys. Yes. Shout um, out to American Lung Association. And thank you so much for, yes, sharing everything and just generally being supportive because I think that that was a very important episode as well to just kind of show people that it's a cause that's important for a lot of reasons. Not necessarily, I mean, obviously lung cancer is very important, but so is preventative measures. So is asthma. So is all of all of these other issues. And especially in the wake of COVID, I mean, with so many people that had lung and bronchial issues, I think it's just a really big thing. So I am just through the roof excited that you are coming, although it's going to add a definite big layer of pressure that I'm a little bit uh, nervous about, but it's, it's okay. going to be great. It's going to be great. And today we have a phenomenal guest. Oh my Susan God, Hayward. we do. Oh my gosh. She, so, and she is, I know all of our guests are, are going to recognize her from something. Cause it's like, she's been in all these different Everything. things, but yeah. I would say one of the deeper conversations that we've had. And I, I like that For sure. because she's just so intelligent that it, it hit home and I like her and I want to be your friend. So I'm going to go ahead and read and let everybody know a little bit about Susan. So Susan Hayward is an American actress. Hayward was born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia, and graduated with a BFA from Carnegie Mellon University. She starred in the PlayStation Network original series Powers and HBO period drama Vinyl. Hayward had a recurring role as Tamika Ward in the Netflix comedy drama series Orange is the New Black. And she made her Broadway debut in The Trip to Bountiful alongside Cicely Tyson, Vanessa Williams, and Cuba Gooding Jr. And was in the original Broadway cast of Harry Potter and the Cursed Child as Rose Granger Weasley. Which so, is Hermione's daughter. Yeah. Which is so cool. And she did a, um, I remember when that came out and she was on In Vogue with Ooh, the cast. She was? I know. So yeah, we'll so cool. to get cool. that and yeah. post a picture. That sounds great. But yes, we are so excited for y'all to hear this interview. So without further ado, Susan Hayward. Well, good, good morning. morning. Welcome, Susan. Hi, guys. How are you doing? Great. It's warm in New York. I'm happy. Looks very warm where you are. Is uh, <laughs> she's, she's got a full beach background going on. So I imagine... <laughs> You're feeling feeling good. Uh, yeah, this is a manifestation of my imagination. I'm hoping to make this real. I'm in Brooklyn right now, and I'm not this close to Coney Island, even though I, I wish I were. Oh, you look like you're in Hawaii. I know. You just look like wherever <laughs> I want to be. But Mission yeah, accomplished. Yeah, good job. I'm feeling more comfortable because I am at an embassy suite. So I'm living vicariously through your background. <laughs> and speaking of background... Could you kind of tell us a little bit about your journey with the entertainment industry and kind of where you grew up and, and how you became involved with it? Mm, I moved to outside of West Philadelphia when I was about five years old. And 
around the time I was maybe eight or nine, I saw Lynn Whitfield play Josephine Baker on a made for a TV movie called the Josephine Baker story. And I was like, I was arrested. <laughs> Whatever I saw Lynn doing, I was like, I want to do that. So I nagged my parents for two years for theater classes. I want to go to theater school. I want to go to theater school. And after negotiating a really great deal, they said, if you get all A's, we will let you go to theater school. And I went and I was like, bam, not a problem. I need the classes. After two years, they finally let me go to theater school. And then my entire secondary secondary career I guess it's like primary school and high school I was doing theater classes and drama school and plays and no one ever told me to stop so I <laughs> went to college for the same thing and after college realized it needed to pay my bills so that's kind of been the mode I've been in since then. Where did you go to theater school didn't you start out in Charleston? I started out before Charleston in Philadelphia I went to a place called Freedom Theater it was a magical place for me. It was a place for kids ranging from ages maybe six all the way up to 18. And you could major in drama, singing, or dance. And it was a place where a bunch of Black kids would go to be serious about creating art, which I'd never been in that kind of atmosphere before. So we would all warm up together and then go our separate ways. The dancers would go work on ballet and jazz and tap, and the singers would trill in the halls, and the drama kids would do monologues and drive everyone crazy. It was heaven. And then you came to Charleston when you moved to Charleston. And then I to Charleston. And I moved to Charleston when I was about 12. And Providence would have it that the Charleston County School of the Arts had just opened a year prior. And I told my family, I was like, cool, this move is your idea. It's really sweet. I still need my theater classes. So they got me an audition at Charleston County School of Arts. And that's where I met Todd, the one and only. Full circle. That's what I was trying to get to. (laughs) (laughs) So Susan, this podcast revolves around a discussion of trauma and overcoming hardships. Basically, we like to think of it as like a healing space. And so I know your work. I know you prior to you being on television and on Broadway, but you have an incredibly wide range as an actress. And I'm wondering in relationship to trauma, how much of your own personal life plays into when you create a character? Specifically, if you have to do a tough scene, do you bring, you know, some sense memory to your work? In the beginning, it wasn't on purpose, certainly. The longer I've been in the arts, the more I understand how many of us run to the arts looking for escape from trauma, looking for a place to be free, comfortable, allowed to feel things. So at the beginning, it was all trauma. (laughs) I'm going to say 90% (laughs) trauma, 10% imagination and work. Like for instance, in order to audition for Charleston County School of the Arts, I needed a monologue, which I didn't have one that I felt comfortable with. So I found a special copy of the Babysitter's Club books. It was a special edition. (laughs) I adore them. There was a special edition that wasn't in novel form. It was written in letters between the girls over the summer vacation. And I took one of the letters that the girls wrote and performed it as a monologue because it was in first person. It was Christy and she was writing about how mad she was at her dad for leaving the family. And looking back, I was like, maybe I had a little few feelings about my parents moving us from Philadelphia to Charleston that I wasn't quite able to express, but I found this moment of art and performance kind of put all those feelings there. And at the time you weren't aware that that's what you were doing, obviously. No clue. Just, no clue. Yeah. So you felt that maybe that's what you were drawing on in that moment. when you, After you went to Carnegie Mellon, what kind of training was that? Do they want you to feed on your own? I would say they definitely introduced us to the technique, to the possibility of using our own pain. I think by the time I left school, I realized that it wasn't wise for me to do without actively being in a therapy process because the craft itself isn't therapy, even though that's what all of us run there for in the first place. Uh, So separating the craft from the therapeutic process has allowed me to draw on things on purpose now. But whereas like in the beginning, you were kind of just using it as your therapy. And now it's like, okay, I understand 
what I was doing yeah. there. And now it's, yeah, now it's like a doorway. Yeah. It's a doorway into this character's pain, you know, an as if situation, as if I were back in that moment. But it's not like opening a raw wound and then right, unleashing me on all my colleagues. I was going to say it's the safest place ever if, you, if you're in that as if reality, right? You know, because you, you can do anything. And you, if you're in that as if reality, it's you as if you're in that situation and you can then step out of it. But a lot of actors, they can't leave. They can't leave it on the set and they, it goes into their psyche. Absolutely. And then you're you're kind of inflicting it on everyone around you without any control. And then it's not a craft anymore. This is fascinating to me because like, so do both of you as performers feel like you are like the a kind of performer that you have to stay in character outside of work or can you turn it on and off? I think the goal, I mean, I don't want to speak for you, Susan, but I mean, I think the goal is to be able to turn it off when you leave the theater, at least, because I mean, there's been a couple of roles that it's been difficult for me to leave. And then there, there'll be, I was watching an interview with Jessica Lang and Oprah recently, and Jessica Lang was talking about how some of her characters throughout her, her years will pop up when she's walking down a street in Times Square and she'll like feel like that character or she'll have a, a memory from that. <laughs> and she's like, get out of here. That's kind of <laughs> you know, fun so, though. Like, but, I, but Susan, what about you? I mean, do any of your characters stay with you? Are you good about leaving them? I'm, I'm, I think I'm pretty good about leaving them. I'm, I feel pretty good about like delving in, in that moment. What I realized is that I end up dressing like the character while I'm playing it. Like when I was doing Rose on in, in Cursed Child, I was wearing like very proper sweaters and, <laughs> and skirts and jeans and flat shoes. And I was like, okay, Rose, I'm going to need you to stay in Midtown. But, <laughs> but when it when it's done, I feel like there's a process that I allow myself to go through to really shed it and let it go because I'm, I'm trying to live my life. I really am trying to live my life <laughs> and not the characters. Well, I can imagine that would be very hard to just live in that same space, especially if you're playing, like you, you've played so many different roles. I know a, a lot of your previous work before re doing research, but doing research today and, and yesterday, it was like so many different kinds of roles. You know, you, you, you played a cop, you've played a secretary, you play, you know, like you're, there's so many different avenues. So children, <laughs> children, which we'll get to children as an adult. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess we, I mean, kind of want to talk about your experiences with all those different jobs that you've done and, and how you've kind of felt about, cause you, you've mentioned this to Todd, kind of the power dynamics that go on in those scenarios and those different jobs and kind of how you sometimes feel powerless because of those scenarios. So do you find that there's like a pretty big disparity in the power between men and women in the industry? Sure. Sure. Very. I feel like it's the, about expectations, right? You walk into rooms and sometimes people's expectations can feel very loud and then you spend, a, at least I spend a lot of time behaving in a way that's either going to go against those expectations and puncture them and then dealing with the reaction of how it throws people off kilter. I mean, I've had a few experiences where I've been acting with a performer. Usually it's a white man and either that performer in, in a very gentle way or even from the director, they'll kind of say, you can't really talk to him like that. And I'll be like, I don't really understand. And when I step back, it's like I've spoken to them as equals. Right. But in the sometimes it's in the work that the character is actually of lower status than that other character. And I, as an actress, it's my job to know the difference when I'm in character and I'm playing the proper relationship in the moment and when we're not filming when we're not shooting and I take my status back as an equal colleague you know when I look at someone's work like Leonardo DiCaprio his status work is so clear and everything he does you know if he's the boss you know if he's the number one in the room you know if he's at the bottom of the room and sometimes I felt like the power dynamics outside would make things a little fuzzy for me to do my can you elaborate on that a little bit Susan Sure. You know, going from walking in and people maybe calling you sweetie or honey or 
having certain expectations that like I had one director and he said this with no ill will, but he was like, you have ingenue face. You have the big eyes and the cheeks and the lips and people don't realize they have certain assumptions about what you're capable of, how you think, how you might express yourself. And so when I let the bass in my voice drop and I don't necessarily smile all the time and I say something that has a little bit more insight or is incisive in a way they don't expect, I see people be surprised and a little perturbed by it. Really? Absolutely. I've had people look at me and go, oh, you're smart. Okay. So I've got so many questions. I'm sorry. That is like, well, not only so insulting, but it kind of brings me back to like on several other podcasts, we've talked to people that are are gay, to other black actresses and performers. And there seems to be this constant kind of theme of like code switching, of essentially making yourself more comfortable to everybody else in the room. And do you feel like you have to do that to be taken seriously? No, I think it's become clear to me that you have to do the opposite to be taken seriously. The instinct to code switch, the instinct to people please, the instinct to live up to unspoken expectations goes very deep. (laughs) And breaking that, I found is the moment that I found for freedom. That's when I find people start to listen in a different way. Sometimes it scares people off, but if it scares someone off, it it wasn't the right collaborator anyway. I've definitely had a collaborator not know kind of what to do with me and then just kind of stop talking to me because they didn't know how to talk. Susan, I want to go back to this when you said, when the person said, you know, you can't speak to him that way and it happens to be a white man. Do you (laughs) find that, is this a, she asked if it was a male, female issue. Is it also male, female race issue? Absolutely. It's absolutely part of the uh, intersection. Right. And we were discussing that. What is the word again? Oh, misogynoir. Yeah. Can you explain that for our listeners? So misogynoir is a term that was created at the end of the 20th century to explain the intersection of oppression when you're both a woman and black. So the first part is misogyny. It's, you know, discrimination against women. And then the noir part is is to bring attention to especially the discrimination against black women. So you have certain situations, for instance, and I'm not saying anything about these actors, but because it's my work, it's a good hypothetical. So in vinyl, I'm a secretary. I'm a black secretary to a white man. There are certain mores, certain expectations that are put upon me because I'm a woman and then other expectations that are put on me because I'm black. And if you're one or the other, you don't experience the Venn diagram of both. And so sometimes it can be a little maddening because sometimes you don't know what signals you're picking up. So when someone says, oh, you're smart, you don't know if they're saying that because, oh, you're older than I thought you were. I thought you were young and dumb. Oh, you're brown. I thought brown people don't read. Oh, you're a woman. I thought women are over emotional. Like there's all kinds of cliches and assumptions people are making about you at all times that you're kind of like, "Eh, which one are you? (laughs) For a long time as a young person, I felt the need to either dodge them or like make them palatable, make everybody feel safe and secure. And the older I've gotten and the more confident I've gotten in my work, the less I'm willing to do that kind of coddling for anyone. Let them be surprised. Let them be taken aback. Well, you are very surprising in your work, I will say. And sometimes it's not, you know, most of the time it's just because you're a brilliant freaking actor and people just need to understand yeah, that. But, um, <laughs> I know. It can seem so but, irrelevant, but still it's a problem. <laughs> you, exactly. But you can be extremely surprising in your work. And because of the way that you just naturally look, it is surprising because you're like, I think people don't know how to articulate that you have such a depth as an actress so they try to make themselves feel comfortable like oh my god i did not know that was in you that you were capable of that you know what i mean but it's not i I don't i think people are not listen some people are idiots but but i i I just you know what i'm saying i do i do understand what you're saying that 
to be surprised by a performer, to be surprised by a piece of work or performance is a beautiful thing. And part of my experience has been to be at peace with whatever way I surprise people, whatever way I upend their expectations. The question for me becomes, why is that a surprise? Why is depth from someone who looks like me a surprise? Is it because we haven't seen it a lot? Is it because you haven't seen it a lot? Like I grew up with I think it's because typically, like I'm talking generalizations, younger people have not experienced as much life as someone our age. So, So you see what I'm saying? So because people see that, uh, you know, a younger looking person with these this mountain of depth, they're, they're a little, they're, they're a little like, wait a minute, is this a savant? Is this person is like super, super bright? I think that it's just ignorance. It's, yeah. it's, ignorance. Not, it's, it's ignorance. It is. I was going to say, Todd, I don't know if you're sitting here trying to defend all the people saying, I'm not, I'm really no, not. No, no, people are people dumb. Are, but, but I think that you got, you got to the point in a great way that it comes down to like, that should not be the presumption, you know, that's that, what like, I'm trying to say. that there yeah. are young people that are smarter than us, like that have had exactly. extensive yeah. amounts of experience that we never had or gone through trauma when they were younger that we've never had. So it's like, I see totally what, what Todd's pointing out that it's like, Sometimes it's just people being people and not understanding, but that we need to shine a light on the fact that you you do need to understand that women are capable, that young people are capable. Yeah, and I would I would encourage those people to take a second look at the kids around them. Take a second look at the people who are different around them. You know, yes, some people are shallow. Some people maybe aren't expressing themselves the way I am. But just because they're not expressing themselves the same way doesn't mean all that depth isn't there. It just means they maybe haven't found a way to express it. Yeah, I agree. I think that it's definitely a learning curve for a lot of people, maybe everybody. Well, folks will surprise you. Yeah, it is. I think that's a, yeah, I mean, I feel the same thing on here before, like business situations where I feel like going into a, a room, a conference room full of people and them kind of not expecting me to speak so articulately or have all these ideas or have like, you know, obsessively researched, that's because that's just who I am, PowerPoint, outline, all this stuff. It's like almost like I was even telling my girlfriend this this morning, sometimes in those rooms, it's like, I'll talk and then everybody's just staring at me like afterwards. And I'm like, Did you hear it or are you in shock? Like, I don't understand what's going on. Can I ask you both a question? Is that primarily men doing that or are there women that also look at you and they're like, I didn't know she was that smart? I think it's more obvious with the men. (laughs) Both of you just took a long pregnant pause. (laughs) (laughs) I will second Laura. I think the the women are more slick with it. Mm -hmm. It's almost like if you think about it, what we've been talking about those women are also experiencing a similar thing. So they're not going to come right out and be like, Oh my God, you, you're so smart. They want to also seem capable as well. So there's this kind of like, I think behind the scenes, like almost jealousy kind of competition aspect to it. So they don't want to show it, but I think that it, it does come out when like you start chatting with another female coworker, and they're like, oh, did you, did you see that so-and-so did this and that? And you're like, mm, you know, this isn't based in like, you're definitely got some issues with that girl. <laughs> so I think it is there for sure on both sides. I just think that men, it's much more obvious. But also I've said this on this show before. I've said this. Women have a different language that men, gay men, straight men, whatever, will never understand. Y'all can have a full on conversation without speaking. That is very yes. Good. That's 100 percent. Which is and I mind like, blowing. But I, it's interesting because this podcast is about trauma. I think it's important to at least put out the idea that part of that conversation, part of that language is survival mode. Right. Like if you're a woman moving through the world, you need to pick up on nonverbals to know that the environment around you is still safe. There's so many things that 
women have to pick up on in order to move through the world that has nothing to do with direct communication has nothing to do with words it has everything to do with oh i think he might be a little hungry a little tired Mm -hmm. that means i'm going to get a different attitude from him this person on the train he's looked at me a couple of times too many he's noticed me i might need to get up and move cars or grab my keys and put them through my knuckles and make sure that i could do what i can (laughs) a classic have you done that todd have you walked oh yeah I feel like every woman has done that. Every woman has like knows that trick where we're just walking around prepared to be under attack. And so part of that language that we're communicating on as feminine bodies might also, I'm not saying definitely, but it might also come from the trauma of being a woman. Yeah. I mean, I think I could see it coming from being a trauma of a woman, but also, you know, you have that added experience of being a black woman. So, I mean, that's, got to be even like, you know, times 10. Oh, hundred percent. Because I definitely code switch between my friends who are white or just not black because there's things that we're communicating to each other out of our shared experience. So if that sh- foundation right. of the shared experience isn't there, I'm not going to necessarily speak that language because it won't communicate. I remember you, we were talking about racism years ago and you said to me that the first time you ever experienced racism, you didn't realize it was racism. It, like when it was happening, you were like, oh, is that what this is? This is, <laughs> is that what this is? I, oh, oh was whoa. That? I I mean, like, you were at like a, you were at like a supermarket or a grocery store or something. And someone was in front of you and something, I forget the specifics, but I remember you, I remember you specifically saying you were actually like, it had never been that overt. Mm. And it wasn't until you came to Charleston that it was so prevalent. That sounds like a couple of times like being in line and just having, and you usually see older white people, having an older white person just like walk in front of you in line, just cut you. Have you ever had that happen? It's like you'll be in line and you don't want to necessarily be breathing down the neck of the person in front of you. So you take a few steps back and then a white person will just come and stand in front of you in line. And they'll do it on purpose and they'll look at you while they do it. A hundred percent or ignore you. And then you'll have to say, hi. I'm standing, I'm in line. And then that time, sometimes I'll just ignore you and pretend you don't exist. And then other times I'll go, oh my God, I didn't see you. Oh, wow. And then we're in like a twilight zone because it's like- Awkward. You didn't see me? Yeah, that, there's a lot of questions there. One, are you, <laughs> are you blind? Do you wear bifocals or, or is it, I, I literally am invisible to you? I'm invisible to you. Yeah, that's just- So that's happened multiple times and- yeah, it's one of those things where when it's happening, you go, is this, is this or is this? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, we talked earlier, Susan, about, <laughs> you mentioned earlier, you're like, I play children as an adult. I want to circle back to a conversation that we had in New York City years ago. And I remember we were in our late 20s and you, at that point, had primarily played children and teenagers. And I remember you saying to me in that coffee shop, I just want to play a woman. (laughs) (laughs) And because you you still, you do look very young. Does this still happen to you? And would you say it's reverse ageism? Because are you still viewed because you have done so many adult roles now? Does this still happen to you? It's switched over. I think my work on Orange is the New Black has helped it switch over. Right. But your last role on Broadway, you played Hermione's daughter in Harry Potter. Yeah, that so, child starts out as an 11 year old at the beginning of that play and she ages up to 14. Oh my goodness. <laughs> but, the, and this is one of the things I've realized both my face and my height on that, because I'm short on stage, you, you really buy it. And because I feel like it's my job to transform, you know, I can people watch some 11 year olds and move my body differently and change my voice. That's fun. When it's not fun is when it kind of cuts off other possibilities work. when people's imaginations kind of stay there. Two things. I feel like getting to play an adult, a leader, you know, spoiler alert for anybody who hasn't seen the last few episodes, the last few seasons of Orange is the New Black, I got to be promoted to play the warden and to be in that position of power, I think maybe changed perceptions. Also, I think adding weight, you know, literally filling out physically as a woman has changed how people see me. I've never really done the sex pod. I've never kind of led with that. I don't know. In vinyl, you looked pretty sexy, but just that's my personal opinion. (laughs) 
I, I appreciate you. <laughs> <laughs> that was perhaps a departure. I wish I had that wig. Oh, God. That wig, though. That wig, though. That wig, though, honey. If anybody at HBO was listening to this podcast and wants to hook me up, find that thing in the warehouse somewhere. <laughs> but, like, you know, filling out my, my face and putting a little junk in my trunk, I think that's also helped as well. I was talking to a friend of mine. She's in her mid-20s now, and when she gained weight, all of a sudden she was auditioning to play mothers. And she was like, this is interesting. <laughs> Where, you know, she has all these other experiences as a young woman, but on site, the expectation is, is oh, young, maybe a few more pounds than the business would expect, young mother. And you so know, I've noticed those kinds of Laura, in the business, when some, when a casting director gets your resume and they all they see is these children and teenage roles in the beginning, I'm sure they were like, she's super young. Well, but, you know. I mean, that's what I was going to say. It's kind of crazy. It's like people in, we'll say civilians, us civilians that aren't in the show business world, you always make jokes, like people make jokes like, oh, well, they pigeonholed this person or they typecast that person. It's like, obviously, that's like a very real thing. And that's my ignorance of not being in the business, but it was, I didn't realize that you could really get just sucked in and not ever yeah. like it. And cause I always thought of it as, oh, that's just what they want to do. Like they want to be that character and mm. starting to kind of learn that, that typecasting is an actual issue. I think that is something that maybe the whole industry needs to kind of be more open about in general. Well, what I've realized now, and it's funny how it ties into trauma, is that the business has become so much more democratic and we really do have the power to show what we're capable of more than we did 15, 20 years ago. We have the power to go make something on our own to show people how we see ourselves. And I think trauma can sometimes take your voice, take your agency, make you forget that you do have power, you know, because in, maybe in that moment your power was taken away from you or, or you lost touch with it. The healing process can be so much about taking your power back and, and not waiting for someone else to choose you or say what you're capable of, but you kind of show them what you're capable or of. Or give yourself. you permission. Yeah. Amen. I love that. Absolutely. I love that because that, that is one way. I mean, as we talk about trauma in all different forms and, and kinds. And uh, I think that that is a big underlying like that is always kind of a constant is to get over it you have to basically take your own agency back and be be more than that trauma speaking of more trauma you are the daughter of two preachers which i have recently learned means you are a like double preacher kid pk PK squared. <laughs> yeah, there you go <laughs> what happens if both of my grandfathers are also oh my ministers? gosh so you're like the PK squared times pi. I don't even know. I don't know math. So, was, but how do you think that, like, as a daughter of two preachers, how do you think your relationship is with God now? And do you think shame has played a role in your life in regards to religion as a whole? I'm very lucky in that my parents, when I was very young, they gave me this understanding that, like, Jesus is your friend, God is your friend. No one can ever take that away from you, ever. So I'm very lucky that that was kind of a foundational belief. As I grew up, <laughs> I did feel challenged because I felt like what religion was teaching me was directly opposed to being a friend, being a support, being unconditionally loving. There were all these conditions that came along <laughs> with religion that I was like, I don't understand how both of these can exist in the same place. And so I had a lot of shame around asking questions, around breaking the rules. I think especially for the kind of Christianity I grew up in, it was like you were a little expected to be responsible for your friend's salvation, right? So the idea that like, if your friends were gay, then it's your responsibility to teach them the truth and to help save their souls. And if you don't do that, their souls are on your head. Like those kinds of, even talking about that is very heavy. Those kinds of mental responsibilities put on me as a young person went against everything that I kind of felt. And so there was a lot of shame of 
kind of going my own way, asking questions, allowing myself to disagree with this huge source of authority and love and spirit and kind of parsing out, again, my own voice, right? What do I say has authority in my life versus what authority was imposed on me from the beginning? Part of my work with one of my current therapists is getting in touch with body sensations and understanding where emotions live in the body. And for me, shame, that specific emotion, it feels like waves of almost nausea in my belly. And so it's become a practice of learning if I'm in a sanctuary that doesn't, is not jiving with my spirit and I start to feel those waves again, I gotta go. The physical manifestation of the shame. I'm and say Laura, that what's that? But what's that book? The that you body read? keeps the score. You knew I was going to bring it up, anyways. But I'm. Oh, I'm you read it too, Susan. Yeah. Oh, life changing. <laughs> but I mean, like that is such a perfect example. But like that gave me goosebumps because I have that exact same feeling. Like when I get to that, that I had to learn that that's what that was. Like that that's yeah. a lot because I have anxiety. But sometimes it's like the anxiety is a different kind of feeling, and then like the actual shame. Like think, like you said, the contradiction of the values that have been instilled in you, but maybe not necessarily like maybe kind of against your will. And then also, <laughs> you know, trying to fit in or, you know, do, th- do the, the cool kids are doing. And I think that that goes even further past being kids, you know, as adults, you still don't want to be the outcast of a group or anything like that. So there's a lot of like trying to mold yourself into that. And it it has that same, I literally get that same stomach churning kind of lower sickness feeling. And I just can totally relate to that. And I know you've mentioned to Todd, a thing called religious trauma syndrome. And I read up a little bit on that. And so I wasn't raised religious. Like my, my parents are not religious household whatsoever. We didn't go to church. I went to lots of different churches when I was in high school to kind of just see and, and dabble in what I kind of felt. And it was like, that was a constant thing that I felt like I had that feeling all the time of like, of, oh, you're a bad person if you don't try to convert your parents. Like your parents, oh, you said your parents are atheists? Oh my God, aren't you so worried they're going to hell? Like this is something you need to do. And I never recognized that until reading up on this. So I want to thank you for kind of like shining a light on that, that that is its own trauma of thinking like, oh, my God, how does your brain even like process the fact that not only am I kind of doubting some parts of this whole story, but I now have to convince my parents that they do it so that they will go to heaven. Like, it's just it's too much, I think, for some people. What is your kind of experience? Do you feel like you have some religious trauma or religious trauma syndrome, if you will? Uh, It's interesting. Uh, The last reading I was doing, it talked about how lately adding the syndrome word at the end is so difficult because usually syndromes have like a finite list of symptoms that you can attach to it. But religious trauma can have so many different kinds of symptoms and we can express it so many ways that you can't really limit it to one syndrome that you can recognize. I would say I definitely had religious trauma. There was shame around what sex could be, should be, what was possible. Trauma around what justice looks like. Like there's a lot of preaching around, how do I say this, love or sin or hellscape, but there's not a lot of talk in in popular Christianity about what justice looks like. But there's a whole lot in the Bible, because I did my research, I I read it. (laughs) There's a whole lot in the Bible about what justice should be from a government to its people. And the schism between sometimes what the U.S. says and what the U.S. does, what, what we know should be justice, but what actually happens, that in my brain really threw me for a loop for a long time. And, and in connection to what the U.S. calls itself like a Christian country and we love Jesus, but like what we do. In uh, God we trust. In God we trust on our money. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> it, it's a, there's a lot of schisms, a lot of confusion and a lot of shame around my confusion. Like why am I'm weird? I'm supposed to understand this. So yeah, I'd say I definitely experienced religious trauma and am still healing from it. Susan, speaking of justice, 
that you were just discussing. You've played many cops on television shows, such as No Orange and the New Black, Powers, played detectives. Do you understand somewhat of the mind of a cop or the police now after playing one for so long? And do you have a different take on the police after playing police officers? Mm. In my research, I did understand how we tend to train police officers here. There is a lot of them versus us mentality. I completely respect the need for a police officer to know that their partner has their back, that they're going into incredibly dangerous situations, that oftentimes the stated goal is to help, is to serve. And I I think I've come to a different understanding of another schism, right? When you go through police training, when those are the stated goals, but then you enter a system that's built to have you do something different, you're in this crux. One of the things that I thought was, it, I had so much fun playing in Orange is the New Black, is Tamika's transformation from kind of accepting what she was taught her belief about who she was, she was a better person because she was in that uniform. She made all the right decisions. And the people who were in the inmates costume, they were, it was because it was their fault. Something was wrong with them. And, in and then when her, one of her friends was in the inmate costume. Who was in the inmate costume. And it made Tamika go, oh, wait, let me look back and see where I had family support where, where my friend didn't. Hmm, Interesting. Maybe I'm not so perfect. Maybe I'm not so intrinsically morally superior. Maybe the system has something to do with it. And so I completely empathize with the value system of a police officer. I also, at the same time, have educated myself on the system that we put in place, the system that the police force comes from. And it's not all protect and serve equally. That was actually a huge thing that you were so kind to send us some articles about stuff, which I feel after talking to Todd about this, I feel kind of lucky because I did go to a school that taught that the history of the police force and how it was founded and and all of that. But not many people really, I feel like, know the history. So could you possibly briefly explain the kind of two different narratives there are out there about the creation story, if you will, of uh, police force and and why it's important for everyone to know about that history? Ooh, yeah. Briefly, what I can say is that the police force as we know it came from an instinct in this country to have a group of people that could either control or capture escaped enslaved people. In this country, enslaved people were considered property. And so when those people tried to take their voices back and take their agency back, it was financially important and financially legal to arm a group of men to go capture those people and to bring them back into slavery. So you've got slave patrols, you've got the Second Amendment being lauded as an opportunity to to arm citizens in order to help them pursue people who are not citizens and to bring them back to slavery. So that DNA is underlying the impulse for a police force in the first place. Do you, do you so really think that like the second amendment, I'm sorry, this is just like very fascinating. Yeah. I'm obsessed with the constitution. Do you yeah. think that that, that is a factor in the second amendment of, if that was what they uh, most, the fear was? Cause it's like, it's sometimes I'm just wonder where is this, obsession with keeping your weapons. When you look at how this country started, when you look at it was a colony and it was an economic endeavor, you look at some states, there were more enslaved people, just the number of enslaved people than there were free white people. And if that large population decided to get together, collaborate and have an uprising, the only thing that's going to give the minority a chance to survive is weaponry. I feel like such an like an idiot almost right now, like because I've never even considered that aspect of it. Like, of course, you think of like you know the Fifteenth Amendment and and wanting did the Voting Rights Act to kind of flip that around. I mean, just how deeply ingrained it is, kind of in every aspect of it, every aspect of our lives here, and and it's on purpose. Like, I want to encourage you and anyone else listening to this podcast. Like, if you didn't know that, if you hadn't thought about that. Don't feel bad about that. It's designed. This place is designed to not 
have us investigate some of these things. Well, Susan, do you think that if more people knew about it and the history of the police, that it would create more understanding? I mean, would it help us heal in the long run? I do you hope believe, so. You know? I always think context helps. I always think that no matter where you want to go, you have to look back and go, where have we come from? What brought us here in the first place? If there's entire swaths of history and dynamics that we're just going to ignore or not educate ourselves on, how can we really hope to move forward? Yeah, I was kind of wondering, like, do you feel like there's hope that we can kind of overcome the divide of like, you know, cause it's, it's gotten such to a point of like, well, blue lives matter and black lives matter. It's like, how do we make it all, you know, and I don't want to say all lives matter because it's obviously kind of right. But how do we exactly. make it so that we're all on the same page that this isn't an institutional thing that continues into the criminal justice system as a whole. Mm-hmm. And how do we kind of reform that? I don't know. It's, I don't know either. <laughs> I, Our powers combined, a, though, we will figure it out. Come on. Come on, Captain Planet reference. <laughs> no, I yes. read too many Captain Planet references. <laughs> He's the best. He's the absolute best. I, I'm honestly of two minds about it. One, I think, you know, just to get out of bed every day, you have to have hope. You have to figure out a way to have some kind of hope. And on the flip side, with the, the reading that I've done, the history of empires is to rise and to fall, you know? Shout out to Hamilton reference. So understanding how history works, understanding that, oh, we're living in late stage capitalism and we might be in the middle of an empire falling right now. That uh, at least if there's not hope for some kind of vision of the future, there's understanding of the present. So if you can understand what's going on, I think that's one thing that's continually traumatizing to people in this country. We don't understand what's happening, right? I, we well, hear it sounds like we're going back to ignorance. Yeah, I don't get it. I don't understand. And education, it's a miraculous thing to go, oh, now I understand. And that's at least a foundation from which to move. Yeah, I kind of feel like, you know, just as an attorney and as someone who's very interested in I say true crime. Well, yes, law, justice, all of it. But, you know, I think one of the biggest things that I hope people learn from, and I want, I kind of want to hear your perspective on this is, is the amount of incarceration that goes on that has been wildly like ignored for so long, but that almost is being shoved or trying to be shoved in people's faces in a good way that where we're seeing now that we have DNA and all of that, that how many people are being basically taken off a death row because they did not do it. They were put there. And that's like us having to come to terms with the fact that when you have these strong stances about the death penalty, all of that, people can can do those like little points or whatever of of what they think is Mm. right or wrong. But it's like, you have to also understand, like take into consideration the fact that we have a ton of people that are in jail right now for things they didn't do. So do you see that there's some kind of positive change in that area? I have to be honest. Well, you know what? I I want to ask first, what do you mean by positive change? A recognition from society Mm -hmm. that there is uh, an overwhelming amount of putting Black people in jail and having a double standard essentially about everything when it comes to that. Uh Okay, if that's the question, I will say yes. I do feel like there has been more awareness that it's still happening, that at the core of the United States, she's, like I said, from colony to today, she's an economic endeavor. And I do see more people understanding that we don't do the transatlantic slave trade the way we used to do it, but we do absolutely imprison innocent people and use them for cheap labor. And understanding now that the style has shifted, but the impulse hasn't of who we are. So I can't help but being encouraged that more than right now from Woo-hoo. you saying this. I'm literally like, when you put it that way, when just it, it, it's just the style has changed. It's just that, the style. That's some shit. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Woo. I mean, it's some shit. That that is like what I loved when you know after Todd had. Talk to me about, you know, the things that you are vocal about and let, you know, want people to know about. I think that that's so incredibly important for people to understand that 
that a lot of these things, the police force, the way the police force was created, that it was in, uh, created to enforce essentially slave codes and slave then codes and then something. goes into enforcing Jim Crow. And then from just that to jail systems to making laws that basically, I mean, the criminalization of marijuana was targeted at black people. Like that was to get and black people into jail. So it's just a you different form of slavery. Yeah. And the idea well, that and you know who is really because- responsible for that. And I hate to say it, Miss Kamala Harris. And I am a fan of hers, but Listen. she she definitely put a lot of people in jail because of pot. And, you know, I don't want to get too political, but I mean, I do like her. And I think get she's political. Done a, a lot. I think she's done a lot for our country. But how are you going to be? And she was the state I'm in now. She was, you know worked for California. So I wrestle with that sometimes because it's like, aren't you also half black? Why are you doing this to your people? Listen, that's part of what I think is so important. What you said, Laura, about education, context, hope. We have to be willing to wrestle with all of a person's legacy. All of us are in this system. Like I I would love to say that I'm above the system, but we're all in it. So we have to take responsibility for the ways we cause harm, that we perpetuate the trauma on other people and how we take responsibility for either lessening it or changing it. I kind of let her, you know, she complicated. <laughs> she's like, she's very, very complicated. This nation is complicated and we're not going to get anywhere if we don't arm ourselves with the tools to sift through how complicated things are. Well, she said she was following the law at the time. Exactly. Of- so there you go. That's what the, I think that's what she's talking. Like what, what Susan's kind of mm-hmm. been saying is the contradiction, it's like just- this, like that there's two different things living in the same Space, so it's like she, ah, like okay, that. Just clicked. So she's mm-hmm. half black, but she's also as a prosecutor is responsible for enforcing the laws. But the laws were not necessarily made to help black people. So how do you do both? Because you know you were enforcing the law when you made sure that black people couldn't read in this country too. You were following the law when you kept generations of people <laughs> illiterate. <laughs> So how does that work out? Well, Susan, I want to shift over being a black woman in this business. Do you think that racism is still prevalent as it was when you and I first started in the business? Has progress been made? I'm going to say yes. And I'm going to then qualify what progress is. So progress to me, maybe not to everybody, progress to me has been, first of all, technological just the fact that we have cameras on our phones, we can afford audio equipment now, we can make our own things. We're not as dependent on Hollywood system to see and be seen. We're just Almost not. like we're not held hostage by them anymore. To, for yeah, content. we're just not. So I would say that with a community behind you, with a little bit of funding, you can make your own stuff. You can talk to your own audience. I don't know if you're aware of a comedian called Kev on stage. Yes. Watching him build his empire, be true to his beliefs, be true to who he is and have Hollywood be like, yo, Kev, what you doing? What's going on over there? You're making that money. How can we get a piece of your money has been completely revolutionary. We didn't have anything like that when we were growing up. We had whispers of Prince owning his own masters. (laughs) You know, that was like the height of ownership when we were coming up. So I would say technology has given us an ownership that wasn't possible when we were growing up. And I would be remiss to ignore that. Um, When you walk on set. Sure. Absolutely. There are people who are more aware of their own internalized bias. There are people who are more aware that the hierarchy of a set is just in order to get work done. It is not a reflection on your value as a person. And I think sometimes the two get confused. People think because, you know, there are maybe one or two on the call sheet that they have power in that context, that it somehow bleeds over into other parts of life. That is not the case. I can feel people being more aware of the, the divide and honoring that. Have you ever had to make people aware? That's a lovely question, Todd. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I've had to make people aware that the power that comes along, the responsibility that comes along with 
being a lower number on the call sheet. I've had to make people aware that. Uh, Can you explain that to our what that means to, to sure. listeners that aren't in the business? Call sheet. Sure. So a call sheet is a document, a piece of paper that has all of the information in one place on how a day on set should run. So you've got a place on the call sheet for everyone, whether that's the director, the producers, the line producers, the actors, the weather, the drivers, people who are driving people to and from. And there is a hierarchy on the call sheet specifically for talent. Number one is the lead of the show. Number two is the co-lead of the show. I'd say between three and 10, three and 14, you have your supporting characters on the show. Maybe anything after 15, those are recurring, those are guest stars, those are people who aren't necessarily in every scene and who are not following, but they fill out the rest of the world. That sheet is to create order. It's to let everyone know what their responsibilities are. It's to let everyone know where they should be and to communicate that among a large number of people. So what you're saying is just because it says you are number one on the call sheet and you are the lead of this show, that does not mean you are my boss. That does not there mean you is. get to call. Yeah, that does not mean you get to call the shots. It means you are the character totally. in this show we're doing. <laughs> and, okay. and and in my work, I've, I've also begun to understand how, you know, number one, number two on the call sheet, they are on set every day. They are there from beginning to end. After a certain season or two, they are starting to make creative decisions as in kind of a producer level because they yeah. understand how the machine works. They now, start to get executive producer credits, too, which credits. is a different which is a different way the waterfall falls. A hundred percent. And it's a different responsibility as well. Just and they because, also get to call more shots. Exactly. So in, in, in some cases, you are my boss if you're number one or number two. But it needs to come from a place of doing the work. Right. It needs to come from a place of making sure that our work runs smoothly, that unions agreements are protected upheld. and upheld. Yeah. Thank you. It's not from a place of I have power and get to tell you what to do. And people feel that. People feel the difference of the intention of that. And you go home with that feeling, that icky feeling, which I think months later, you can look back at that job and it can still resonate with some sort of like, I don't know, like icky feeling. Which the way trauma does. Trauma, which creates like, you know, worry when you go on your next set. And if you have to 100%. work with this actor again. I'm working with my therapist specifically on social anxiety for when I go to work. Really? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. He's like, cause I have, I would say good kind of PTSD from both career context and life stuff. So my somatic system gets really activated when I'm around a lot of people that I can't necessarily control. I get very afraid. And then I start to look for cues in other people to know that I'm safe, to know that I'm okay. So we actively have sessions where he talks about the situations that make me the most anxious, that kind of make my nervous system dysregulated and how to practice going on to set and give myself tools to help me deal with the social anxiety of going into those, those rooms. How do y'all end up getting to that place? Are there specific things like specific sure. triggers or is it like, have you sure. been able to figure out examples of that? Yeah, I'll give you an example. So on one show, Delilah, which was on OWN, my character had her nails done, right? So it becomes the, the responsibility of the show to get my nails done. That's not a personal expense. So I would go to set and have a manicurist come on set and, and do my nails. I would be speaking to the manicurist and they would just like kind of nod and shake their head and be very deferential to me, right? And it wasn't until another PA, another production assistant came in, asked if we needed a heater. And I cracked a couple of jokes that said, oh, yeah, don't worry about it. We're fine. Just leave the door open. We'll be cool. The PA that walked in, I watched his shoulders sink. He exhaled and he went, OK. And I said, you all right? He said, yeah, you know, in my position, you just don't know when you're going to offend somebody and when they're going to get you fired. So I realized that because I have, a, I'm a certain number on the call sheet, right? In that show, I have a certain amount of power just being in the room that people who are lower than me, they 
kowtow, they shrink, they make themselves smaller. They do anything they can not to offend me because they know I have the power to get them fired. Wow. A word of like, I like how that manicure is talking to me. She didn't do it right. We need to find somebody else. That's that person out of a job. Mm. You've got to kind of like deal with the both sides of it. I mean, it's like the, not only do you worry that you are that person that might not be high enough on the call sheet, but also if you do get to that level, then now you're responsible for everybody else that's below you. Sure. So much pressure. Sure. And after that PA walked out with the heater thing, the manicurist, she said, she was like, you're cool. Thank you. You're cool. And I can see her visibly relaxed as well because you go into these sets and you just don't know if someone's there to do the work or if someone's there to have a power trip. There is a definite difference. I feel like when people, people notice when you are actually doing the work and you're not just the title, you know, that you actually put in the effort and then that small amount of kindness that you can show to people to just make their lives. Like, I, I don't think people realize how much you're not just being nice and they're going to go home and be like, oh, that person was nice to me. It's like you may have actually like changed their experience body and chemistry. thought process. Yeah, their body chemistry. Mm-hmm. That that might have been healing for them to be like, okay, I can be spoken to with respect by somebody in a position of power. So that's amazing. Yeah. Well, I know that I really dove into the racial aspect, but have you kind of ever felt like as a woman in this business that you've been objectified? as a whole. You did say earlier that you'd never really played the sex pot or led with that. So now that you may be, maybe go into that maybe for another part of your career or maybe be considered for those roles in the future, are you worried about objectification? Um, so have you and are you? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm trying my best not to worry, just in general. People are mm-hmm. going to do what they're going to do. I do think part of me not leading with that has been my fear. I didn't want people to pigeonhole me. I did want people to just see me as a sex pod. And I also see how difficult it is. I see how hard people work to stay in the gym. They don't eat. They get their hair done. They do the makeup thing all the time. I just wasn't willing to do that. (laughs) And moving forward, I'm more interested in full characters. I'm more interested in a character that maybe has a sensual side, has a sexual side, and isn't afraid to express it, but also isn't defined by it. And I don't know, that might be work I get cast in, right? Because you're dealing with how people see you. If I've done roles where I don't lead with that, it makes sense that a casting director wouldn't bring me in for a role that needed a certain amount of sensuality. There's a reason I did not audition for P Valley. Those are strippers and they are using their sexuality as a commodity. That's not something I've ever done in my work. So there's that, there's the casting possibilities that my work has opened up for me. And then there's, you know, if I decide to do a project on my own and kind of explore that on my own, it wouldn't be with fear that somebody was going to pigeonhole me because I'd have control there. Yeah. Well, at least there's that. (laughs) At least you don't have to worry about that part of everything. I'm happy with it. I didn't want it. I'm so grateful that there are intimacy coordinators now because like to to do that kind of work. Intimacy coordinator. Yes. Yeah, so it's a, it's kind of a new, p- newish position. I maybe in the last seven years. That's- you know why it became developed because of the Me Too movement. Oh, yeah. okay. All right. So women and men, there were some in sex scenes or whatever. It can get a little <sighs> intimate, yeah. obviously, and <laughs> people need to feel safe. People need to feel professional, professional mm-hmm. while being so vulnerable. And sex scenes might look very, very impromptu, but they are extremely choreographed. Yeah, I've heard that. That sounds like it it almost sounds Intimacy coordinator. Go ahead, Susan. Explain what intimacy coordinator. Well, an intimacy coordinator is is a professional person whose job it is is to mitigate the needs of the script, the needs of the director and the story, and the needs of the performers. So you have someone whose job it is. They've been given the authority to make sure the set is maybe a closed set so that the performers feel comfortable to facilitate the conversation between performers. Where can I put my hand? Can I squeeze to actually make sure that contracts are enforced because people will sign contracts. And then if a director or an editor wants to use that shot, maybe what was actually signed is going to get ignored. There's that famous shot of Sharon Stone crossing her legs and what was it? Basic instinct. Mm-hmm. 
That's not on purpose. She didn't give that performance. That performance was taken from her. She thought that she was getting rid of her underwear for a lighting concern in the costume. Uh, this is real? Yeah. Like she came out and said this? Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. That wasn't her being like a bold actress and taking charge of her sexuality. That was her being a team player. She thought she was taking care of the costume department, the lighting department. She made a move and then the director kept it in the cut. Wow. You can have a director on set that that wants an actress to be topless and the actress has signed in her contract she's not doing any nudity. And then you get a director that's really, really intimidating and really pissed off and is like, I'm going to fire you. If we don't do this, which the is, would be illegal if it's in your contract. Right. Yes. And so the, the lawyers come out. More Sorry, right now. I'm just getting <laughs> angry. I'm like, now I'm like, why weren't there intimacy coordinators to begin with? Because and it was his, Hollywood, baby. It was Hollywood. I just can't and, believe and, and, Sharon Stone got tricked into showing her vagina. <laughs> this is just like blowing my mind right now. Sorry, but continue. It was a different time. But the intimacy coordinator can say to the director, I'm shutting that down. This is not happening today. This is the whole conversation. Boom. Like, I'm shutting you down and they report back to the unions. The union can then have the director removed, whatever. But now it's so on high alert that a lot of directors are not even going there anymore. If an actress is not comfortable or an actor is not comfortable, but I will say it used to be that they only wanted women. Always women got naked and showed everything, but men never had to show their penises. But now it's fair game now because they're like, why do the women always have to be objectified? If the role calls for it and it's going to forward the feeling or the intimacy of the shoe. Yeah. Do they get an intimacy coordinator if a a guy has to get, you know, show? They better. Okay, good. I want to make sure we got Mm -hmm. equal opportunity all across the board for this. Right. But isn't it great? It's like there's systems that we can put in place to protect people and to prevent the trauma in the first place. My dear friend, Stephanie Hodgson is a coordinator on set. And she said it's been one of the most rewarding, empowering experiences because to be a woman able to say to a man, she's uncomfortable and we're not doing this scene today or she's uncomfortable. Can we make sure that the camera doesn't pan down any, whatever. She said it's been a rewarding experience to protect people. That's mm. awesome. I like that a lot. I just, mm. I, you know, I know it, it, you, we're a slow species, so sometimes it takes a little while, but I just, it makes gives me a little happiness knowing that that's a thing. I'm going to shift gears here for a second, Susan. You recently got married. Congratulations. Okay, thank you very much. Very exciting. What do you find are the biggest obstacles of maintaining a relationship in this crazy business? Ooh, I haven't been married very long and we did get married in the pandemic when the business was like, <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> so you're like, Have, haven't experienced it yet. <laughs> yeah. But, so in, in the reopening, what I, what I found is that I got used to the speed at which some things move where you audition for something, you do the call back, you test for it, you book it. And now you're, you're like removed from your life if you have to shoot out of town for an extended amount of time. That's like normal to me. I came from regional theater where you put your life on pause for a few months, go perform and then come back. I married someone who is not in the industry that way. So for him, it's very strange. He's like, you're going to go where now for how long to do what? (laughs) And, (laughs) And so really communicating clearly communication communicating clearly the demands of the profession like I swear I'm not just like on a seven week long frolic vacation vacation. you are right now with this background but like yeah it's like yeah right it's that's (laughs) optics right it's the optics are you're going to some location and that you're getting served like you know my ties between sets but it's and it looks sexy for Instagram. We have long hours. So really communicated that like, this is all put in a professional setting. If there is into me that's necessary, it's work. This is not a threat or has anything to do with the personal life we are building. It's putting perspective on you know, my job versus my life. And for a long time, my job was my life. And so now doing a lot of work to separate those Yeah, two. do you find that, that that's kind of a difficult thing of like, since y'all got married during the pandemic, now you're going back into this stuff. Like, it's like a whole new world of it's your a, relationship. It's literally a whole new world. And, and the, the momentum, our ability to plan things is different because during the pandemic, things were changing, but 
Our world was so small that it was the two of us kind of against the world. We can do this. And now that the world is opening up, he's getting emails about potential jobs in other states and other countries. I'm getting emails about potential jobs in other states and other countries. So now we have to build the communication lines of like how fast things are going. Babe, we just got this offer. We need to talk about what it will mean for us to take it. It's probably a lot about setting boundaries for each other. Like I need this. I need you to communicate this. It's all about parameters. Well, I also like kind of, am, I'm just curious, like, how do you make that decision? Like, do you sit down and say, okay, well, you've got this job that, that wants to take you here. I have this job that takes me there. Do we both just go to these places and then we meet back? Or are we going to choose one avenue or the other? Like, how do y'all kind of navigate that? I feel like that. The last one, I was in the doghouse for a little bit because... <laughs> Your girl got excited and was like, yes, <laughs> sign the contract, email, send. And then he looked at me like, <laughs> do I matter? <laughs> <laughs> that was fast, fast, Susan. I was like, you're right. You're right. That's fast. That's real fast. And then I got an email very quickly after that. My agents were like, all right, we're so excited. You booked that thing. Let's keep you booked and busy before you have to go away. Let's try to like, they're doing their job, you know, let's slip something else in that also films outside of New York City. And I mentioned to my husband, I was like, oh, I have this other audition for this thing that filmed somewhere else. And when I tell you, he was like, I have words. <laughs> he, he was like, how are you going to leave me for this amount of time and then try to slip in something else to leave me again before? Like, what are our priorities here, really? And so it helped me go, okay, the speed at which I'm used to making decisions as a single person, it's got to shift. There's got to be more conversations. That's got to be hard. I mean, yes. because as actors... It's what gets us out of bed in the morning. It's our craft. It's our, it's our love. It's our, it's what we, we need to breathe. And I feel like when you get a job and it's a really great job and it's, you, you want to say, yeah, I got to take it. Cause you know, there's so many actors that can go to anybody else. They have 10,000 people waiting to take that job. Yeah. I was going to say, that's gotta be tough. Cause like, at least with, you know, I don't know what your husband does or what his profession is. He's a musician. Okay. Well, so it seems almost like that's also very similar, but like it, it you can't. Like, let's all get together at dinner and discuss these contracts like every time because you might just lose the mm -hmm. job altogether. So, yeah, that does sound tough. So I guess knowing what you know now as mm -hmm. a very accomplished actress, um, mm -hmm. if you could Thank go you. back to the beginning kind of of your career, what would you what kind of advice would you give your 21 or younger self? Go to therapy now. <laughs> preventative therapy <laughs> yes go to therapy right now post haste and you know the world was different technology was different but it shouldn't stop this create your own work now you know i went to carnegie mellon and they had i think it was a few weeks where we had play fests where they canceled classes and we could create whatever we wanted and i felt so overwhelmed by the freedom actually, because I went from church to theater to school to all these things where the authority is outside telling me what to do. And it's taken a lot of therapy, honestly, to like recalibrate that sense of authority and to not be overwhelmed by the freedom and the responsibility. So I'd say to start practicing that as soon as you can, just make your own shit, make terrible, bad, terrible <laughs> art. It's kind of funny. It kind of reminds me of like a, when I was in high school and I've mentioned this on the podcast before, and I swear one day I'm going to get this transferred to digital so people could see it. But I wanted to go to film school at NYU and I, I, I got in I, at night. But what the, how I got in essentially was that my senior thesis project was creating a documentary about local musicians. And it was just like I was so blissfully ignorant about how any – of the business worked whatsoever. Like my, mm -hmm. all my experience has just been theater, whatever, but I just went in, made it, cut it, did everything, like had my own score, all of it. And then I made VHS tapes and I put them in every single application <laughs> to every school. And I was like, well, I don't think I'm going to get into like Columbia or anything, but NYU, like film school, like psh, 
this is art. And so I sent it off and I did get accepted, which was amazing. But I ended up chickening out because I honestly did more research. And part of that was that I felt like I wasn't going to have that freedom anymore, that I was going to be told what I should and shouldn't make, that I wouldn't have the artistic expression that I wanted to have. So I feel like I almost had like this reverse thing. So, I mean, I, I would say, yeah, that is great advice. And don't listen to anybody. <laughs> if you've already got that going for you, keep doing it. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Susan, what is ahead for Susan? What do you think the next decade of your life looks like? Ooh, the next decade. I need to travel more. Okay. The U.S. is an incredible place. There are so many opportunities here. You can do things here that you literally cannot do anywhere else in the world. I need to make sure I travel so I know what I'm talking about when I say that. I feel like a lot of the messaging and the marketing around the U.S. is what I've just said. But a lot of us don't take the opportunity to travel and make sure it's real. My husband is from Colombia, so I, I want to spend as much time in his home country as I can. I spent six weeks there before we got married and absolutely fell in love with it. Did you? Oh, absolutely fell in love with his family there, the land, the people, the culture. You know, no place is perfect, but getting perspective on the U.S. by getting outside of the U.S. completely changed my life, and I wanted to change my life more. In terms of healing... Absolutely, in terms of healing. So one of the places we went to was Cartagena, which is a city on the coast. And the time we spent in Charleston, it was like going to a city that's Charleston's cousin. You could see the effects of colonialism, of Mm -hmm. commerce, of racism, of tourism. It was so similar. Yeah, and I agree with you. I've been to Cartagena many times on the cruise ships. It is very Charleston adjacent, for sure. Charleston is Jason, hundred percent. Charleston is Jason. Getting outside the U.S. helps you understand why we are the way we are. It helps you value the beautiful things about us, and it helps you understand. Okay, there's things that we need to work on. So I want to travel more. I want to be more like Laura and take control and create more work for myself. And I'd love to have a family. You know, I'd love to create my own. Have a baby. Yeah, a baby. Well, and then, then then take them all over the world. Yeah, that. Yes, that. A little travel partner is actually pretty fun. I'm just saying as a, you know, it's it's extremely stressful, but also very <laughs> rewarding to have, you know, your your little mini me go with you to places like that and then expose them to that because, you know, then that's experiences that you didn't get to have as a child and it I think it all the traveling I did with my parents, like that was very important to them. And that I see the world and be like like America is not the only place like you were, this, yeah. there is an entire world out there. So, and did they travel when they were growing up? No. So they honeymooned in Myrtle beach. They got married mm-hmm. and literally went to Myrtle beach for one night and that was their honeymoon. Mm-hmm. So once they became successful, they were like, you know, this is something that we're going to do and our children are going to do. And they very much and mm-hmm. put that like impress that on me. And thanks mom and dad. I really appreciate it. I feel like I'm a better person because of it. So get out there and travel. There's so many amazing places that can just teach you so much. And you see in action the things that you want to see change in America. But you also have to remember that America is such a young country. Like we are not like going to places where it's like going to Greece, going to Italy. And you're like, this thing has been here for. 5,000 years, whereas America going to like, Wales and seeing castles. And yeah. You're like, oh, my God. <laughs> and it's like, oh, is this a real castle or? A- <laughs> yeah. Uh, the hell? Yeah. This is moss. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> well, BC. <laughs> <laughs> well, we definitely don't want to take up too much more of your time. We really appreciate you coming on. But we do have a tradition on this show to ask a question of the day, which is kind okay. of, you know, we, we answer on our own, but after all this deep combo, I think it's going to be a, a nice little nice. palate cleanser. Breath of fresh air. Um, yeah. Something like, okay. So, uh, what activity makes you lose track of time? Oh, that's so good. <laughs> Dancing was my first love. I started out doing ballet, jazz, and tap. And what? yeah. 
Yeah, before this is before Charleston. Before Charleston. What? Do girl? You're a, you're a dancer. I'm actually a dancer. In my, in my heart, I'm actually a dancer. In my heart, in my heart, I'm a dancer in my heart, too. I'm, a dancer. I'm also in my heart a dancer, but you know, in my heart, um, like not professional. Uh, yeah, not professionally. No one should pay me to do that. No <laughs> one should pay me to dance. And also, like the the business again, it's one of those things where you're a kid and you're looking forward and you're like, okay, y'all want me to break my body for this? I'm not trying to like break my body open for that. But yeah, I love pole. I love pole dancing. Before the pandemic, I did a couple classes at S Factor. Um, pole dancing. And, oh my gosh, yes. The PK it's, on a pole. <laughs> I mean, that's the safest version of a PK on a pole. <laughs> I know, right? Us, PK, <laughs> us PKs have a reputation for a reason. <laughs> yeah, they'll say there's some sort of intimacy oh, okay. coordination going on there, where you're <laughs> quite in the nice, the allowable pole. Area. Yes, Listen, this, poll classes. I've heard that it is a workout. It's a workout, honey. It that that core, that upper body strength, but then also you put on some music. You turn the lights off. You turn the bass up, and okay, time stops. Time's absolutely <laughs> non question. That's awesome. I love this. Well, I'm glad you get to still explore that area of what yeah, you're doing. Too. And, so- <laughs> and certainly no one should pay me for that because that's different. <laughs> that's- <laughs> no, 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 that's different. <laughs> no judgment. But I'm, that's yeah, I'm yeah, 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 yeah. You, you have other ways of making money. It's okay. Yeah, truly no judgment. That's just not my life. Yeah, for sure. Well, this has been amazing. <laughs> You are just delightful. Yes, it has. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having this. You know, healing and trauma is is all around us. And I really believe that what we put our intention on is what grows. So to put our attention on healing is the way to bring you closer to us every day. So thanks for having me. Of thanks course. for coming. All right. Thank you for Adore coming. You. Love you. Bye. What, what an amazing human. Oh my gosh. I just adore her. She's like, it, it, you know, not in a, a childlike way because she <laughs> obviously is not a fan of that. But no, I mean, she's just so smart I know. and aware. I did not expect a lot of, of what came out of that. Like I did not know that she was working so much on herself and going through therapy to kind of figure out where these feelings, the physical manifestations. And you know, I'm obsessed with that. I know, you know, when I knew Susan in middle school and then into high school before she went to governor's school, which y'all didn't even discuss that y'all both went to governor's school. But I didn't Um, go to the real, she went to the real governor's school. I went to the camp, (laughs) which which you also (laughs) had to get into. So it was like, you know, I, uh, she's way more right. impressive than I am. Go, can do. <laughs> but uh, so she, she was very shy in school when she first came, but she got, you know, she, I remember when she got to school, they cast her as Juliet in Romeo and Juliet. And she had just gotten, and I was like blown away by her performance then. And then she did a monologue. I remember in school, I forgot what play it was from. And I just went, this girl is going to go places. She's really? so you saw that in her? captivating. Oh my God. I knew that Susan was going to be successful in anything that she did, but I knew that if she wanted to do pursue acting full time, that it was going to be a matter of time. And she's so captivating to watch on film and on stage, but she just know, gets I, her part. Like, that's why I was kind of saying, like, you've just done so many different things. She can put on like that different suit, if you will, of like yeah. being a whole new human in each right. performance. And it's just so and, impressive. Right. And her quest to find out more about herself informs her character development with the character she plays. I'm always blown away by her and I'm so honored to have her friendship, but she is such a cool, I'm glad you two have met because I didn't realize that there were so many similarities. I mean, you guys are both avid readers and I don't read. I love <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, for y'all out there, Todd gets everything uh, well, through some sort of audio device. We're not sure or how TikTok. TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I like I, I love. I love that she sent articles about like these things beforehand. I knew that you would. So as soon as she sent those, I was like, <laughs> she didn't tell me she was going to do that, and then she sent it. And I was like, oh, Laura's going to eat this up. I love you're, you're a not. You're like a sponge when it comes to like you're like, you're like an encyclopedia. I know, you love it, to learn it, it stuff. It literally does like large sections of my day can just be taken by like, oh my God, now I'm obsessed with this concept and I just go down this whole rabbit hole. But I think the biggest thing that I admired about her is the fact, one, that she recognized that she needs to speak out to get over things that she's been through. And that's a very hard thing for people that aren't necessarily like us who do a lot of talking. And it's kind of remind me of Regina, how she was like, I didn't think I had anything important to say. And then as she's gone on, like gone through life, she's like, no, I do. And I'm going to say it. But I think the fact that she's very much like championing this educational aspect of we really do need to understand our history and understand the present. Because I think sometimes we're a little guilty of it of like, well, how do we get to the happy place? And it's like, well, we don't necessarily know all the time. I think what it takes the, is knowing what's happening now. And the, the more we do this podcast, the more I feel like I'm being enlightened right. by our guests, just and especially with Susan's experience. I didn't know about Massage and Wah. I had never no, heard of that before. No idea. Um, <laughs> so it was a very educational thing. And, and also she is so committed to her own healing and her own growth. I think that's what's inspiring. I think for all of you listening out there, if you can find an outlet for yourself to get therapy, to talk to a friend, to talk to a family member, because if you keep it all bottled up inside, it will manifest itself physically or it will manifest itself in behavior. And so I think that she's such an advocate for mental health. No, I'm just like, you know, that, I mean, that's obviously what we're into that anyway. So like, we're going to be cool with it, but it's like everybody out there, like, oh, I just want to just shake people sometimes and be like, I know what you're saying right now is not what you actually think. It's some sort of manifestation of your anger from this and that. And it's just like, if people could have that same awareness in everyday life, like how different our world would be. We're all very different, but we're all the same. We all operate from two things, love and fear. They Mm -hmm. teach that first day of acting school. Any emotion that you have, it comes from love or fear. And Susan, I just adore her and the woman she's become, you know, because I knew her when she was a girl. And now knowing her as a woman and coming full circle with that, she is very inspiring. And she brings it to her work, right? Yeah. She brings yeah. it to the work. Yes. That's why she keeps getting books. That's why she's, you know, on a career, her career is just continuously a steady, you know, yeah. what did Andre de Shield say in his study, except speech slowly is the fastest way to get to where you're going. Oh yeah. Yes. And I think that she is excelling at that. And I think it's like also cool though, to talk to somebody who is currently experiencing her husband and her getting married during COVID and then having to balance like their careers again. Like, you know, she's then like, okay, yeah, I, I still am. Like, nobody knows everything. And I think right. that she's a perfect example of like, it's a journey that you are trying to learn everything. You want to learn as much as you can, but it, it's always going to be a struggle because life is ever changing. And I loved her, her answer to the question of the day. I know, which leads us to the question of the day. So. Well, first of all, she stole my answer, my original answer. So I will give that to her because she's an actual, (laughs) seems like she has a lot more (laughs) dancing experience, especially on the pole. Impressive. No, Um, that was a little shocking for me. I think you you missed the fact she was like the pole. And I was like, oh, damn, she is. She's talking about (laughs) it. Lay it down, Susan. And then like 20 seconds later, you're like, do you mean pole dancing? (laughs) <laughs> no, I got to kick out that. But no, I, a minute. well, I guess like a, a main thing would be, you know, this podcast is very big thing that like an activity where I lose complete track of time because, you know, we were trying to be cognizant of time. So I'm looking at it, but it doesn't feel ever as fast or, hurt, you know, like it feels like it's one second long and it's so hard right. to compact all of it into this right. little space. And so the podcast makes you lose track of time. It does. But I'm also like, <laughs> Hopefully just, that's good for our listeners too. <laughs> yes. In a good way, please like enjoy it. And then you, you know, hopefully aren't really late to everything like me. 
So what activity <laughs> makes you lose track of time? You know, I was going to say TikToking because I'll sit there for hours and do that. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't know. you can only give so many, TikTok is an answer to so many things. <laughs> if I'm working on music or if I'm learning something for an audition or for a callback, I will sit there and it, I will spend six hours and I won't even breathe. I won't even come up for air. And then I realize, oh my God, it's not even light outside anymore. I've been working on this all day. I get lost in that. If I have to learn something by a certain time, if I have a deadline, I get, I have to get obsessive for a few hours and then it will be there the next morning. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, what a great, it's, it's, what, that I just want to say that that obviously is paying off for you. So don't, you thank know, you. I think, yeah, as, as we know, but yeah, it was a fantastic interview and I hope that everybody else enjoys it as much as we did, because I just think she's fantastic. And I want, I, as I just said during our break, I want to have part two, Susan, because we didn't even touch on so many things. So I know we'll have her back on. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, it was a pleasure to see you as always. You too. See you next time.